aperture. My my story's kind of different. Some of you might have seen some of it before. It's been published and even out there all but but uh, I'm not only the photographer, I'm the addict in the pictures. Uh, I'm going to start here and then backtrack a little bit and then go forward again. Um, I was a, a heroin and crack addict for like the best part of 10 years, cycling, and in that process I was a, I was a working photographer, a good working photographer, and that's how I met Paul many years ago, and uh, I started using because I just started using it. It seemed fun, it was something that I hadn't really done too much of in the past, and at that moment in my life, it just took me all, it took me all the way down. I, I ended up that person that I thought I would never be, the one that was like, had lost everything, their livelihood, their relationships, their kid, their money, their home, their everything, living in the project in a crack house, or a dope den where people were coming and going constantly 24 seven, and that was what my life was used to, you know? And during that whole period, I, or a few years into that period, I started taking pictures. I started taking pictures. Of, started taking pictures of people around me. To be honest, I used it as an excuse to keep going back to the projects. I was doing this project and projects, and uh, I could take pictures of people and then buy crack and dope and shoot up and do all that sort of crazy stuff. But I always had an excuse. I was taking pictures, and I was different. And as I became friendly with a lot of people and got deeper and deeper into it, and my other life spiraled out of control. I started to turn the camera on myself, and there was a couple of reasons for that. You know, I, one of them was uh, uh, I realized that people, when they were kind of fucked up on drugs, they would say yes to anything. You know, you get they had a couple of hits of crack, you could say to anything, they would say yes, or they were nodding out on dope, they would say yes to anything. You know, and it started troubling me a little bit. And then a couple of dealers that were around when I was taking pictures were sort of like saying, don't get me in the picture, I don't want to be on the internet and stuff like that. So it started getting me thinking that, you know, maybe, maybe, oh, <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe I should start um, just pointing the camera at myself because the life that I was photographing as then was the life that I was leading and there wasn't really too much difference at this point. So that's what I did, I started photographing myself. And these are a bunch of snapshot pictures that I had printed out at various points when I was an addict and I, I ended up incarcerated for ten and a half months and uh, you know having cycled through the criminal justice system many times and then detoxes and cold turkey and then, then short stints here there and in and out of Rikers for short periods now eventually I got sentenced to six months and then I was transferred to York County Prison for five and a half months where I went to immigration detention because they tried to deport me because I'm not American. And when I got out, I found all these pictures and all these digital discs that had all these images on it, and then you get all this ephemera that various, a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine actually, he's actually a drug dealer, but, uh, and various other people, my now wife Susan, <laughs> who had been in my life throughout this whole trajectory, had gathered up my stuff and put it in storage or kept it for me, and I started finding these discs from cameras and everything, they had all these images on them. And so I was faced with this dilemma as to what to do with it. I looked up to a few people and asked them, and the consensus was mixed. You need to put this away and forget that part of your life. I was clean now, I was out of prison, I was rebuilding my life. And other people were saying these are really important, you should put them out there. So I wasn't quite prepared to make that jump at that moment. So that brings me to the other thing that I found in the various books and magazines and empty pants pockets and everything was these I'd made this thing about collecting the heroin baggies that I used to buy in the streets in New York at that period over that decade. And I was just kind of intrigued by the designs and the fact that you'd go to the Bronx or Queens or wherever you went, Red Hook, and you'd ask for the drug. You wouldn't say I'm looking for heroin, you'd say I'm looking for traffic or looking for, you know, dragon or whatever the stamp was on it, you know. And I sort of kept a lot of those. So I had all those and I thought, this is a better way to sort of get my. Because addiction is really shame based and I was still. I was clean and I was better and I was making amends and doing all that sort of stuff, but I was really ashamed of what I'd been to and I, my self-esteem was sort of destroyed and I really didn't know how to approach people. Even though people knew what I'd been through, I wasn't too comfortable talking about it. It wasn't even now, it was like a while ago when people weren't so open about talking about opioid epidemics. That wasn't in the, the, the language of addiction at that point or recovery at that point really. And so 
I started putting these around, and I had a couple of magazines publish them, and that was that way of putting my name out there, associated with heroin, I was out doing full Monty and throwing these pictures of myself out there. So I had these published in a bunch of different magazines, and I, published, I actually published a book of them and had an essay written by Sean O'Hagan, who's a photography writer for the Guardian magazine the newspaper. And uh, it's interesting looking back at them, because there's a sort of way that they're marketing and everything like that, and it made me realize how sophisticated drug dealing is and how the branding and marketing of that product was not any different from the brand and the market and the iPhones and various other things. They brought it out there, it was really good, but you always had to upstage it with something else because they made it not as good. But the battery your iPhone runs down, the power of the dope runs down, you move on to something even better. So I had this big show in LA of them, and that was really the way that I, I still have all the baggies. <laughs> And that was really my way of going back and looking again at these pictures. Polaroids, snapshots, contact sheets, digital prints of me as an addict. And I took all the pictures of everyone else because I felt I didn't want to show them. But some of those were people that had got their lives together. And I, I just felt uncomfortable about putting the pictures on the internet for facial recognition in ways that people could find them. It just Ethically, I just couldn't really do it. So I took all those pictures up and I was left with just me in my environment over a decade and I started going through them slowly but surely printing them out and I showed them to various people, I had a big box of them and I've got all the arrest papers and the ephemera and all that sort of stuff still as well, much like what Nina has as well, you know, and I went through all this stuff and kept looking at it and looking at it and deciding what to do and eventually I went to a couple of big magazines, I went to New York Times and New York Magazine, The Guardian Magazine and I sort of pitched it to them and they Took it, took up on it. It first ran in New York Magazine as a feature in print, and then it was in the Guardian, and that was me. I was out, you know. I was really that was I was coming clean. I was letting everyone know, and in a way, it was really cathartic and healing for me because I didn't have to lie and sort of make excuses for where a decade of my life had gone, and I really. My wife Susan did the interview with me and we ran it with an interview and then a story about the trajectory of what I'd been through and it got such amazing feedback from me and it, it really empowered me. It, the, the amazing thing was that it really empowered me to go out there and talk more about addiction and people reached out to me, a lot of people reached out to me and asked me could I talk to their son or their father or their brother or someone who'd been affected by it and then people that I never ever imagined that would come to me and say I can't believe what you just did, you know, because I've, my brother or sister, someone they knew had been affected by addiction and they never shared it with anyone. So it became this big thing for me that all these people were coming to me. It was a little overwhelming at times, but I was quite happy to take the time out to talk to anyone, especially people who had a family member who was struggling. So I'm going to quickly go through these and uh, just give you a little bit of the, how I made the pictures. At that time, it was, a, it was a long time ago, there was no raw files and digital cameras, none of that analog stuff was either lost or sold or in storage or somewhere else that I wasn't using it. And um, I had these little digital cameras that I rigged to, to take pictures every 10 or 15 seconds and I just set them up and let them take pictures. And often I wouldn't find the images for days, weeks, sometimes months, even years later when I started going through them, I would find the images that I took. And uh, yeah, that's how I did it. And you know, the environment I was living in, I was living with friends that I knew that I shared using drugs with in the projects in Gowanus and Wyckoff houses and living for a long time. And this is a view from one of the windows. Often I would just lay the camera on the floor, take a picture of me getting ready to do whatever I was doing. This is me obviously getting ready to shoot up. But you know, you use needles again and again and again to become so blunt, you're trying, you can press your finger in it and it's so dull that you know, you're wondering if you're ever even going to be able to get it into your vein, you know. But people, people have often asked me, you know, how, how could you be able to take these pictures while you were an addict? It's like, you're an addict, you're, you know, and you know, yeah, I was a really heavy heroin and crack addict and my life was totally out of control and I was, I'd pushed everybody I knew and cared for and loved out of my life, including my son and my, Susan, my wife, my family, everyone out of my life over that period of time. But I was a photographer as well, and I felt this need and desire to record what was happening to me and make these images. And I always come back to people and say, yeah, but you must have been, how can you do that? And it's like, well, you know, Keith Richards wrote a lot of good songs when he was a heroin addict. Basquiat <laughs> made some really killer paintings when he was a heroin addict. You know, 
Philip Seymour Hoffman acted in a lot of great movies when he was a hero and addict. We're not defined by what we do, we're defined by who we are. And, you know, I was still capable of making those images because it's not like you're fucked up high the whole time. There are plateaus where you're, you're realizing what's going on around you. And that dictated how I took the pictures because I had a photographic background. I trained as a photographer, as it were. You know, and I knew the power of the image. And I was, you know, I was very selective about what I did. I knew what I was doing when I was taking the pictures. I just didn't know what I was going to do with them. You know, and this one here is like, I'm, I took the picture, then I fell off the couch, and I'm lying in the debris, and this sort of cracked down and broke them. You know, so there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these pictures, you know. I'm going to go through them quickly because I got the two minute warning. And this one of me, I just leaned, I found this one years later, that's me leaning against the light, and the light's bleeding in because they exploded, and my head's become the cavity. So it um, sums it up a little bit. And the great thing, I had an exhibition of these at the Scottish National Portrait Gallery last year for six months, and that was really an amazing thing for me. But they purchased all the pictures and gave me a six month exhibition with all the ephemera and a video and everything like that. And the best thing about the whole thing was, apart from having my, <laughs> my druggy picture in the front of the very, very old museum, was that my mother, who I'd become estranged with for many, 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 many years, came to see the exhibition and came to see my talk that I did there, and it was the final bonding after decades of sort of trauma between the two of us. So that picture there is the most meaningful picture I have to be honest with you. you know, it really, it means the world to me. You know, we've been so distant for so long and my addiction has driven a wedge between us, it was insane. And, uh, she came to see the exhibition and understood it. And it was the final making amends to my mother. So that's really important. But just to, the last minute I want to go into these very quickly, and it's a little bit what Jeffrey talked about. Is that I don't want people to be defined by addiction and being addicts. And so the people that I photographed but didn't show their pictures using, I've now gone back to find. This is Yolanda. I did a lot of drugs with her. I smoked a lot of crack with this woman. And I found her she, in the Bronx. She's nine years clean and has got her life together. And I'm working with her right now. This is another friend of mine that I used with a little bit, way, way back, who's clean as well. This is Tiana and Tito. I did drugs with both of them for many, many, many years. They're eight years clean, they've got two kids, and they both have jobs. This is James, who's a really good friend of mine, a homeless heroin addict for a long time. He now works in a hospital. That's him on his way to the hospital. This is Billy, another recovering addict who works in a furniture warehouse fixing antique furniture. Is clean for nine months. This is a friend of a friend that I photographed who's also clean for several years. And this is a really, really good old friend of mine, Daisy, that I spent many, 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 many years in my life. And I can't believe she's even still alive. And she said exactly the same thing to me who we met for the first time in eight years last weekend. <laughs> and this is her with her partner and our kid our grandkids living in the Bronx and cleaning sober for like seven years and these are the stories that I'm focusing on now, is the stories of recovery, where people have picked up and moved on, because it's all fine and well to point out the problems of addiction and say, look at this terrible thing that's happening, but we also have to look at what's the solution to this and how did people get clean and what was their process? And, and what I've found out with these, and Susan's been doing interviews with everyone as well, and we've gone back again and again, is that everybody has a different route to recovery. And it's not just a one size fits all, and not everyone's medically assisted, not everyone's AA, and not everyone's this, that, or the next thing. It's a number of different ways, but they all find their way, keep them clean. And I just want these stories to be hopeful stories to say to people that, you know what, people do get clean, and it's not an anomaly, and they work it in different ways, and it is possible. So that's my 10 minutes one. Thank you.